And uh, the only difference between her number and my number was the prefix. He got the, the wrong prefix. And anyway, uh, he started crying on the phone. He said, I really, I really do need you. He says, I need, I need what you got. And he told me how his girlfriend, and isn't that something? When they talk about girlfriend, it means they're shacked up woman, you know. Anyway, uh, she took off from my best friend. Anyway, I went and dealt with him and took an old fella with me, and that was back when I was pastoring. And after a little while, he realized that he's going to go to hell. And he asked the Lord to save him. And uh, the second one, and then and I'll be preaching time. The second one was uh, Bill Clark up in uh, Ridgeview, Illinois. I got a wrong number call there. And anyway, uh, same thing. He got a wrong number. I said, no, maybe you didn't get a wrong number. Maybe you got the right number because I'm a Baptist preacher, and I can tell you how you can know that you're going to heaven when you die. Now, do you know you're going to heaven when you die? You know, they hear it. Well, I guess I don't. And I says, well, I didn't call you. You called me, and you thought you got a wrong number, but maybe you got a right number. And after talking with that fella for probably 10, 15 minutes, he asked the Lord to save him. And are you ready for this? I called a preacher who I gave. I got his address. And I called a preacher who was just 30 minutes from where he was at. He said, oh, what a coincidence. Coincidence ain't in the Bible. Amen. Providence, you can find it all the way through the Bible. Yes, sir. Anyway, uh, the message tonight, somebody pray while I'm putting this on. What do you preachers pray? Father, we come in Jesus' name. Father, we love you. But Lord, be honest, we're a poor and a needy people. Well, now, Lord, please Lord, touch the preacher. Loose them tonight, give them liberty. Lord, I pray that precious, incorruptible seed would fall on some good ground tonight. Yes. Oh, I pray our hearts wouldn't be hard and stony, but I pray it'd be that good ground that would bring oh, forth God. fruit Heaven. to the glory of God. Lord, we ask for your help now. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Luke 16. Mm. I don't think this is, this is on here, but the old man got to turn green? Yeah. Sir, turn green. Now you move around? Yeah, you move around. Okay, turn green. Luke 16, and all of you that have been in church any amount of time at all, you know what Luke 16 is all about. So uh, anyway, I could have stood up here and said, well, I want to uh, center on one of the Bible characters. And sometime back I was preaching, I said, how many of you think I pick out Peter? And some said, well, maybe Peter. Then some said, well, maybe Paul. And we went down the list. But nobody picked that fella without a name in Luke 16. Did you know the rich man, there's no name. And he still exists. So in Luke chapter number 16, we'll read a few verses. And those of you that have heard message after message after message about this, That's right, it won't be the same. And uh, God's word is so designed that you can hear it over and over and over. It's repetition. And if repetition bothers you, then this book would bother you because you can find salvation all the way through. You can stop anywhere. And see, the Old Testament's pointing towards Jesus. So in Luke chapter number 16, verse number 19, we'll read together. There was a certain rich man. By the way, when God's word is so plain right there when it says there was a certain rich man, rich man. You know what that means? There was a certain rich man. Okay, let's go on. And he was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. And seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom, and he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, 
and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. I heard a preacher one time says, who in the world would ever want to pass from hence? How many mothers would go across there to rescue a son or a daughter if they could? That makes more sense when you hear that. Anyway, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Even the rich man knew the language, didn't he? And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Need another preacher to pray. Why don't you jump up and pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, this evening for your word. We thank you, Father, for your grace that you give to us. Father, Amen. That you filled this house with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Yes. We need to hear from you, Father. Make him decrease so you may increase and bless us with your word. Father, be with us tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> Amen. So we're going to zero in on a Bible character. I'd much rather zero in on Peter or Paul or one of the disciples and hear how they were filled with the power of God and many of them just I guess I can relate to them just dumb old farm folks the way it would seem you know these disciples but God can put his spirit inside them dumb old people and they can be used of God some of the greatest preachers I've ever heard are you listening never, been, never had an opportunity to go to college some of them were overseas. And some of those men that preached in the Philippines, they're just so full of God. That's a whole lot more important than them college degrees. Yeah, Amen. Right. So we're going to zero in on a Bible character this evening. And you say, well, why would God put you up there first? This is not a camp, this is not a camp meeting, shouting message. But I believe it's message for the hour. You listening? And you wouldn't believe all the obstacles that the devil tried to throw at us today. My honey over there, she's smiling at me. I mean, wrong roads and, and traffic jams, and you, you can't believe it. And I guess the Lord was just kind of nudging me. He said, well, you probably end up having to preach tonight. So uh, I can't do it, but he can. So the rich man, what do we see in him? We see in him a wasted life. We have in this room this evening people that can testify of a wasted life. But aren't you thankful? In the nick of time, you realize what head, where you were headed. And you ask God for that grace and thank God for the grace of God that rescued us and changed our destination from hell to heaven. But this was a wasted life. He was clothed in fine linen, the Bible says. And he had uh, everything this world had to offer. His whole time was occupied with the wardrobe and table, what he put on his body and what he put in his stomach. But when we look at the word of God, when it says, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments. I looked up that word torments. I, I, I tried to find a worse word in the English language that was worse than torment. I couldn't find one. I, I mean... Uh, it's related to pain, and I don't know about you folks, but I don't like pain. Man, I'm, I'm quick to run to the Advil or the Excedrin bottle or something like that. And thank God in the day and age which we live, while there's usually relief. But can you imagine? That character we're talking about tonight has never had one moment's relief. And... You've heard messages on hell like I have down through the years. But sometimes, sometimes I've heard preachers preach it so mean. But listen, there ought to be a compassion in our hearts. There ought to be a compassion in our hearts. 
So there ought to be a compassion in our hearts. How many of you know someone, if they don't get saved, they're going to hell? How often do we pray for them? How often do we come to an altar and don't leave until there's a puddle of tears and and believe God's word says if we would cry over them, shed tears. He had a wasted life, and he was an unfaithful steward. A man who has riches has them from the hand of God. If you have a bank, you know what? God knows exactly what's in your bank account and what's in your rat hole at home. I mean, I don't know. Preacher don't know either. But God knows. And God has enabled you to have that, and praise God if you're saved and living for the Lord and paying your tithe and giving to missions, uh, that, that little nest egg will probably get bigger yet. But it comes from God. See, a man who has riches has them from the hand of God. Deuteronomy chapter number 8 and verse 18 says, But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth. He had it all, but he didn't acknowledge it to come from God. He was one of those probably, I'm going to get all I can and can all I get. So he was an unfaithful steward. He also was a soul unprepared for death. There is probably some folks in church tonight, a soul that's unprepared for death. You say, my, who could that be? Well, God knows. God knows every one of us if we're totally, fully prepared. You see, that's one of the things I, I've got a message I preach the most shocking. And the most shocking was the years that I pastored was the number of people that got saved at Fellowship Baptist Church in Lebanon, Ohio were the church members that already made a profession, that had already went through the tank. By the way, they didn't get baptized, they just got wet. Already went through all those motions. And when God the Holy Spirit dealt with them, there was weeping and there was conviction. Simple word for conviction is just plainly Realizing their sin. Realizing they ought to die and go to hell for their sin. You ever realize that? That you ought to die and go to hell for your sin. I ought to die and go to hell for my sin. Well, I'd be so thankful for what he has done. We're going to heaven, those of us that are saved tonight, because of what he has done. Because what we do doesn't amount to nothing. So I'll give you a few thoughts and then this old man gets sit down. A wasted life, an unfaithful steward. This isn't too alliterated, but it's what God wants. A soul unprepared for death. He lived as though there was no other world but this one. Did you know we have people all around us today, they live like they just this is going to be it. That's right. They lived as though there was no other world but this one. He lived as though death would never come his way. Proverbs 27 verse 1 says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knoweth not what a day may bring forth. I tell you how easy it is for us in America to just live day by day by day. Anybody go hungry today? How many got up this morning and looked at the eastern sky and said, Lord, perhaps today? If you did that, you'd probably raise your hand. But we really wasn't looking for them. And sometimes when I do that, Sometimes when I do that, I done it, done it not too long ago, and I just I start crying. You ever had those mixed emotions where you're rejoicing because you're saved, then I start thinking about loved ones. I've got cousins and relatives, so many that they're in a dead church, and some of them have just told me, well, I got my faith. Because they were raised in a church and they believe there's a God. But they know nothing about being saved. Oh, what a rude, Amer- a rude awakening. And then some of them are close relatives and friends. Now, if you just stop and think for a moment, shouldn't that motivate us for 
2019. That there's a terrible, terrible hell. And if they would die tonight, they would be there. Never, 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 ever to get out. Yes, sir. Unprepared, a soul unprepared for death. Then we're already half done, so we're, we're doing about right. That death does not end at all. The rich man died and Lazarus died. Luke 16, 22 and 23, the rich man also died and was buried and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torments and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Not any new things, just some thoughts that maybe we don't stop and think about enough. I uh, was challenged several years ago to think about hell every day. Yes, and uh, I said, Lord, that's not a very good subject. But I was praying, Lord, help me to stay motivated. He said, just think about hell every day. Mm -hmm. And then he added one more thing. He said, just think about what it costs to keep you out of hell. Yeah. That's right. He died on the cross for my sins. He knows so much about me. Even the very hairs of my head are numbered. Yours are too. He knows so much about you. When that rich man died, all hope was gone. In hell, he lifted up his eyes. But Lazarus, he was, he was, he was on cloud nine, wasn't he? Death, his death, that rich man's death was a terrible awakening to this rich man. And what's sad today, some of us have loved ones, we raised our hands a few moments ago, and they're going there. And it's so difficult. Many of them, I, I know some families that are so poor that the girls strike out on their own and before you know it, why they're, they end up being a, just a, a cheap prostitute to some man because they can't make a living by themselves and, and just shacked up. You see, you don't like that word? That's what it was 50 years ago when I first got saved. That's and right. I think that's what it is today. That's right. And uh, this boyfriend, girlfriend stuff. And death was a terrible awakening to that rich man. Then as death found him, eternity kept him. So if we just stop and think for a moment. Do you know someone that's lost? Do you know someone that's one heartbeat from a devil's hell? How many of you have already made some Resolutions, just wish you'd wave at me. Not too many. Wouldn't it be good? Wouldn't it be good? Now, preacher didn't tell me that I got to go so long. He didn't tell me, well, you got to have an invitation. You got to do this, got to do that. But I'm just thinking, I only got a couple more points. But if you've not made a New Year's resolution, how many of you know someone that's lost? Have you been to an altar yet this year and prayed and cried and said, Lord, if they die lost, they're going to they're be in hell forever. They'll never get out. Oh, I, I prayed one morning and I couldn't help it. I prayed and prayed and cried and prayed. And there's a bunch of people I pray for every day. So far they haven't got saved. But they're just one heartbeat from being in that horrible, horrible place. No relief. As death found that rich man in the place where the tree falleth, Ecclesiastes 11, verse 3 says, there it shall be. Luke 16, 26, no going back. If we could go, that's what it's talking about, going across that gulf. If we could go back there, we would. I've got some friends I grew up with. We went to a Christian school I can remember going out and drinking beer with them and, and, and the cussing and the dirty stories and the immorality. One of them died young. One of them, uh, the wind caught a lid of one of his self-feeders on a cattle, cattle farm, hit him in the head, killed him. 
all I can, all I can remember from him is drinking beer with him. And dirty stories. And cussing. Immorality. And, and if he's in hell, it's like that rich man, tormented day and night, forever and forever. And then I think, well, Lord, there's no help in him. But Lord, break my heart for those folks that can be reached. So I pray that this year I'll pass more tracks. I'll tell more people how to be saved. I'll do all I can. I want to be in the middle of the Lord's will. How many of you would come to an altar or kneel right where you're at right now? I'm just about done. And say, Lord, I'm going to make a a resolution right now. I'm going to, I want to be a soul winner. I went all last year and I never led anybody to the Lord. I went all last year and I barely passed any tracks. But this year I want to do different. Amen. He was not in hell because he was rich. He was in hell because he had neglected getting right with God. Some are coming to the altar. This, this is, I know this is not the way we'd usually do it. Isn't that right, Brother Bill? But listen, if God's got a hold, God's got a hold of you like he's got a hold of me. Are we just going to sit back and let him go to hell? Are we going to come to an altar right now? Or just turn around and kneel or pray where you're at right now? And say, Lord, I'm, I'm going to make a resolution. I'm going to do something. I want to pray that, Lord, you'll help me to be supernaturally bold to warn my loved ones. Some of us have children, grandchildren, they're headed for hell. Every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to pray. Lord Jesus, I pray that you'd meet with a special. Meet with a special these next few moments. And Lord, may everybody in this room realize that there's a God right now that knows all about them knows how much they've been serving you, reading their Bible, praying, and witnessing. Oh, God, I pray that there'll be many that make a decision and say, Lord, I want, to be a, I want to be a witness for you this year. I want to warn people. Lord, I thank you. I've put out about 2,000 gospel tracts, and I know there's many more around this place. But, Lord, I pray that folks would leave desiring to be a witness. And Lord, I've never been much for New Year's resolutions, if we can call them that. But Lord, we can make a decision right now that we're going to serve you better. That we're going to serve you better this year. Help us to do that. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. A preacher's coming. And don't let anybody tell you that you have to get up stay there as long as you need to That was a needful message right there. Every one of us sitting here tonight, if you're saved, you ought to have a burden for lost people on their way to hell. It's not hard to pass a gospel track out. That track is a portion of the Word of God. And it's the Word of God that brings about that saving faith in the individual. So, if you mind the Lord, God will put it on your heart what you need to do and when you need to do it. I 
I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame I'd rather be true to his holy name than to be the king of a vast domain or be Dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. fairer than lilies of rarest bloom, sweeter than honey from out of the cone. He's all that my hungry I'd rather have Jesus and let him lead than to be the king of a vast domain or be study in the book of uh, Revelation in the last segment of this year the Lord gave me a song and uh, speaks of the uh, the conditions in heaven Ten thousand times ten thousand saying hallelujah. Ten thousand times ten thousand saying amen. Ten thousand times ten thousand singing holy, holy, holy forever and forever and forever.
sons of our great God forevermore. If every knee could bow and all the angels shout, Hosanna in the highest to the Christ of Calvary, still I would fall down before the mighty Prince of Peace and praise the one who
I don't think I could teach him any more playing the piano. <laughs> He's got past my talent. You know, Brother Bruce made a statement about this is the quietest place you'll ever be if you're saved and get to heaven. But you start thinking of what those words, 10,000 times 10,000, singing and praising, holy, holy, holy. Amen. Amen. Lord. I actually had a couple, of it, well, they were, I felt bad about this, but visitors. I had me a little spell one Sunday morning, and they got up and left. No, yeah, I couldn't believe that. You know, you folks need to learn to praise God. Amen. Yeah. I mean, it's, everybody sits back there. Move me if you can, preacher. I'll tell you what, the Holy Ghost of God can move you. Amen. If you're saved, Amen. when you say the word of God starts being preached or some song comes down, God comes down and touches your soul, That's right. you're going to have a hard time holding it in, honey. I hate to tell you this, and I tell you everybody wants to bite their lip and say, I just think you ought to just step back some once in a while and just say, praise God, I'm glad I'm saved. That's right. Come on, Brother Keenan. Brother Mike Keenan, this is my buddy. Here's you some water if you need it. I Thank brought you. it all the way up here. From hamburger? You got a hamburger? Yes. Yes. No, I don't have no hamburger. <laughs> you want to take the Bible? Hey, man, it's good to be saved. It's good to be in Florida. Man, I left Philadelphia, and then it started sleeting and snowing and all that kind of stuff. Hallelujah. I'm down in Florida. It's 82 degrees. And take your Bible. It's, we're going to start in uh, Judges tonight. Judges chapter 15. Judges chapter 15. If you all see uh, Brother Cobb leave, it's because he can't take preaching. Uh, you younger folks, you are, you are growing up in an America that I don't know anything about. It's not the America that I grew up in. And uh, I say that, and I'm, I love America. I think it's the greatest country in the world. I pray for her, but she, she'd rather have uh, li liquor than God. I mean, y'all do realize that we voted liquor out of America at one time. It's called prohibition. But we'd rather have liquor than God. Now we'd rather have dope than God. I mean, they're legalizing marijuana. God, our independent Baptist churches will be high all the time, won't they? I'm going to be honest with you. Do you mind if I'm honest with you? I sort of feel like this is home. i uh, been coming here a while, and preacher is my good friend. But I am angry. I'm not happy with the job the church is doing. The church is supposed to be salt. Salt is a preservative, and the church is supposed to be light. But I'm telling you, the world is having more of an influence on the church than the church is having an influence on the world. And so as a preacher, I'm not real happy about it. So I usually preach on it, and that's what I'm going to do tonight. But before that, I'll give you something to chuckle about, and then it'll be over. I want to I want to say something to all the kids who survived the 30s, the 40s, the 50s and the 60s. First of all, we survived being born to mothers who did things they shouldn't have done while they were in a family way. They took aspirin. They ate blue cheese dressing. Tuna from a can and they did not get tested for diabetes. Then after that trauma, we were put to sleep on our tummies in baby cribs that were covered with bright colored lead-based paint. We had no childproof lids on medicine bottles, no locks on doors or cabinets, and we, when we rode our bikes, we had baseball caps, not helmets, on our heads. As infants and children, we would ride in cars with no car seats, God help. 
No booster seats, no seat belts, no airbags, bald tires, and sometimes no brakes. <laughs> Riding in the back of a pickup truck on a warm day was always a special treat. Amen. We drank water from the garden hose and not a bottle. We shared one soft drink with four friends from one bottle, and no one actually died from this. We ate cupcakes, white bread, real butter, and bacon. We drank Kool-Aid made with real white sugar. And we weren't overweight. Why? Because we were always outside playing, that's why. We would, be, uh, we would leave home in the morning and play all day as long as we were back when the streetlights came on. No one was able to reach us all day, and we were okay. We would spend hours building our go-karts out of scraps. How many of y'all remember that? And then we'd ride down the hill, only to find out we forgot about the brakes. <laughs> then after running into the bushes a few times, we learned to solve that problem. We didn't have PlayStations, Nintendos, and Xboxes. There were no video games, no 150 channels on cable, no video movies or DVDs, no surround sound or CDs, no cell phones, no personal computers, no internet, and no chat rooms. We had friends. And we went outside and found them. We fell out of trees, we got cut, we broke bones and teeth, and there were no lawsuits from these accidents. We ate worms and mud pies from dirt, and the worms did not live in us forever. <laughs> we were given BB guns for our 10th birthdays, and we made up games with sticks and tennis balls. And, and although we were told it would happen, we did not put out very many eyes. We rode bikes or walked to a friend's house and, and knocked on the door or rang the bell, or we just walked in and talked to them. Little League had tryouts, and not everybody made the team. Those who didn't, they had to learn to deal with disappointment. Imagine that. The idea of a parent bailing us out if we broke the law was unheard of. They actually sided with the law. These generations have produced some of the best risk takers, problem solvers, and inventors ever. The past 50 years have been an explosion of innovation and new ideas. We had freedom, failure success and responsibility, and we learned how to deal with it all. If you're one of them, congratulations. You might want to share it with others uh, who've had the luck to grow up with kids before the lawyers and the governments regulated so much in our lives. While you're at it, forward it to your children so they will know how brave and lucky their parents were. <laughs> Kinds of, kind of, Makes you want to run through the house with a pair of scissors, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm not advocating this man, but y'all have probably heard of a man by the J, uh, name of Jay Leno. Leno. He's not a saved man, heathen. But this was a quote that I found from him. He said, with hurricanes, tornadoes, Fires out of control, mudslides, flooding, severe thunderstorms, tearing up the country from one end to another, and with the threat of swine flu and terrorist attacks, are we sure this is a good time to take God out of the Pledge of Allegiance? That's an amazing thought. A heathen man had that thought. Amen. Ask for the old paths. You're looking at somebody that wants the old paths. Let's uh, take our Bibles, Judges chapter 15. If you're able uh, tonight, would you stand with me and we'll honor the reading of the Word of God. I'm going to pick up in verse number 7 of Judges chapter 15. Okay, now listen, if you get finished before I get finished, you just go ahead and leave, okay? Don't get mad at me or anything like that, amen? Uh, I'm losing my eyesight. I can't see that clock, and so uh, we'll not worry about it. Y'all only do this once a year, camp meeting, right? You ought to come to get in, not to get out. Amen. 15, Judges 15, verse 7. And Samson said unto them, Though ye have done this, yet will I be avenged of you, and after that I will cease. And he smote them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and dwelt in the top of the rock Edom. Then the Philistines went up, Now you notice that's a new paragraph, so some time has elapsed. 
Then the Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why are ye come up against us? And they answered, uh, Bind Samson, are we come up to do to him as he hath done to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went to the top of the rock Edom and said to Samson, Knowest thou not that the Philistines are rulers over us? What is this that thou hast done unto us? And he said unto them, As they did unto me, so have I done unto them. And they said unto him, We are come down to bind thee, that we may deliver thee into the hand of the Philistines. And Samson said unto them, Swear unto me that ye will not fall upon me yourselves. And they spake unto him, saying, No, but we will bind thee fast and deliver thee into thy, their hand, but surely we will not kill thee. And they bound him with two new cords and brought him up from the rock. And when he came unto Lehi, the Philistines shouted against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the cords that were upon his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands loosed from off his hands. And he found the new jawbone of an ass, and put forth his hand, and took it, and slew a thousand men therewith. And Samson said, With the jawbone of an ass, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of an ass, have I slain a thousand men. And it came to pass, when he had made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramath Lehi. And he was sore athirst and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. But God clave in hollow place that was in the jaw, and there came water there out, and when he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Wherefore he called the name thereof Anhak Kori, which is in Lehi unto this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines twenty years. Uh, preacher, pray for us, would you? Amen. 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 Thank you. you. May be seated. I want to. I want to preach a message on. We need a new jawbone today. If you look at the first six verses of Judges chapter fifteen, uh, Samson had aggravated the uh, Philistines. You know the thing about the three hundred foxes and setting the thing on fire and and all that kind of business. And uh, Samson. Samson's a guy, there's, there's a lot of different preaching on Samson. You know as well as I do that Samson, there's a lot of potential that was in his life that was never fulfilled because he never got victory over his flesh. But if you go to Hebrews chapter 11, guess whose name shows up? Samson. Which means that there's hope for us. <laughs> and so... There's times in Samson's life as a judge of Israel that he's doing okay. He's not always been in Delilah's lap. He's not always been down at the prostitute's house. Can, can I say this? Can we just be honest with one another tonight? That life, in, life in a saved person's life, there's good days and there's bad days. And those of you who say you don't have a bad day, you're a liar. There's days when you laugh, and there's days when you cry. There's days when you got victory, and you don't think you'll ever come down out of that mountaintop. 
boy, there's days that you just get knocked down and defeated. There's days you overcome temptation, and there's days that temptation just seems to take its toll on us. There's times that you have the power of God on your life, and you know it. You're walking in the spirit, and then there's other days you're just walking in the flesh and just as carnal as can be. Nod your heads like this. I'll hear them rattle, okay? There's time, buddy, that you brag about the victory for the glory of God. Amen. And then there's times that you just can't. There's seasons. There are seasons of victory in Samson's life. You could go through it. Chapter, I mean, he, he the, the angel promised him coming. Uh, as a child, he grew. The Lord blessed him in chapter 13. In chapter 13, the spirit of the Lord began to move upon him in the camp of Dan. I mean, in chapter 14, he's taking a lion and ripping a lion Amen. apart with his bare hands. I mean, uh, the spirit of the Lord comes upon him and, and uh, he's, I mean, listen, you know, he slew those 30 guys, took the raiments. There was a times of victory in his life, times of power in his life where the spirit of the Lord came upon him. But he says he's, he, he smote him hip and thigh. You know what I hope to do tonight? I hope to do some hip and thigh preaching. You know, it's easy to fight the enemy when the Spirit of God is upon you and he's empowering you. And we have had seasons like that. But you know, we talk about revival and we use it as a very general term, but most of the times we all need revival in some area of our life. I mean, sometimes we need a revival of our love for that book. And I appreciate your message, Bruce. I really do. We need a revival for a compassion for a lost and dying world. We need a revival sometimes for our love for our wife or for our husband. Sometimes we need a revival of our love for the things of God. And so those seasons come and those seasons go. In Judges chapter 15, verse 9, those Philistines went up and pitched in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. And the men of Judah came, why are ye come against us? And they answered, to bind Samson, are we come up to do to him as he has done to us. Guys, we have an adversary. We have enemies, plural. And just as the enemy came up against Samson to do to him as he hath done, we have enemies. They want to torment us. The enemy, those of us that are saved, the enemy wants us to quit. The enemy wants us to compromise. The enemy wants to destroy our families. The enemy wants to tear up our marriages. The enemy has locked on to our children. And the enemy wants our children. The enemy wants to tear up in the church. And we could go on and on. Could you say amen there? Amen. Till the, till the Philistines showed up. And the whole bunch shows up. Not just a few. To do to him as he had done to them. You know what Samson had been having? He had been having a pretty easy time slapping those Philistines around. But you know, you slap somebody around long enough, they're going to slap back. And if you think the world or the devil... It's going to let you get by with living for God and serving God and trying to steal his children out of his household. You're crazy. And if you preachers think that you're going to preach that book and take a strong stand on that book, irregardless of public opinion in the independent Baptist churches, you're crazy. We are living in the day of apostasy. We are living in the day of lukewarmness. Man, I don't know about y'all, but I got inoculated to preaching when I got saved. Yeah. Buddy, I never, I am, I'm, I'll be 66 next week, and I've been saved for 42 plus years. And I'm telling you, there ain't no preacher, and I got to hear some of the best mule skinning preachers this side of glory of my generation. Never did they offend me. We are living in such a sissified society. Uh, Y'all can sit in front of that idiot box 
and you can watch lesbians and sodomites mess around, take the name of the Lord in vain. You can watch adulterers and fornicators jump in. That doesn't offend you. But let the preacher jump in your kitchen and preach on your sin. And you suck your thumb and grab your blankie and say, I'm offended. Yeah. That's good preaching, preacher. Amen. 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 Right. Now, you don't have to amen me. I amen myself. Yeah. I love the work of God. I think it's a great privilege and an honor to be involved in the work of God. And I love preaching. I didn't say sharing. And I didn't come to share nothing with you. I didn't come to speak to you. I'm going to preach to you. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I love preaching. Uh, an old preacher said, "Good." I'm talking about good preaching now. I'm talking about Bible preaching. Yeah. Right, good preaching is, is the light of God. How many times has the man of God preached the word of God and God's just turned that light on for you and said, now I see that. Yeah. Right, good preaching, that's the life of God. Good preaching will help you with the Lord's presence. It'll come in that preaching. I tell you, we're just an entertainment society. Yeah. Amen. Hey, I'll bet you the crowd picks up when the Rochesters get here. Why? Because I like that entertainment. Say amen right there. I'll tell you, the best part about church is good preaching. Now, I like good singing. Good singing will get you ready for good preaching. But, I mean, we don't magnify the singing over the preaching. Amen. I tell you, that preaching, that's a lion slayer, buddy. Amen. You know what preaching will do? Good preaching. I'm talking about good preaching. It'll stop you from living for the devil. That's what, that's what Bruce said. He said he got saved. And then he got under preaching, and he stopped living for the devil, never went back. That's what happened to me. I got saved. I got under preaching. I can still, Bruce, I can still, I was a Roman Catholic for crying out loud. There's priests that didn't, they didn't preach. And I remember the first time I walked in a Sunday morning, a Bible Baptist church, and that guy got up there and he opened up that book. He shouted. Spittle came out of his mouth. He was in Titus. He was talking about somebody's mouths must be shut. And I leaned over to my girlfriend. I said, baby, don't say nothing to nobody. He was preaching it like it was the word of God with authority. This ain't a smorgasbord. This is the way. Walk ye in it. I'm not here to debate nothing with y'all. I'm right and you're wrong. I said, why? Because I'm preaching the Bible. Amen. That's the truth of the word of God. Amen. Yeah. Preaching, will, that'll stop you from living in sin. Right. That preaching, that'll stop you from living for the world, yeah. living for yourself. That good preaching, that'll help you get victory over the bad habits of your life. We all had bad habits. Yeah. Yeah. A bunch of you still got bad habits. Yeah. Come on, let's be honest. Yeah. Hey. Why don't we get right on Monday night? And you could really enjoy this meeting this week. That's right, amen. Yeah, good preaching. Good preaching. That'll, that'll tear those desires of sin out. And that'll ruin the old lifestyle. It'll change the way you live. Change the way you walk, you talk. That good preaching is the enemy of sin. It's the adversary to the devil. It's an opponent to the world. It's a foe to the human mind. It despises the flesh. That, that's, that's that good preaching. Y'all got anything to say good about the flesh? Because I ain't got nothing good to say about the flesh. This flesh has caused me more trouble in 42 years than the devil has ever even thought about. Say amen right there. So in verse number 10, the enemy came. And the enemy's going to come up against us to try to stop us, to try to destroy us. Those Philistines, they rose up. Man, they'll try to get that gospel preaching stopped. They'll try to get you to stop living for God, serving the Lord. Try to get you to stop listening to preaching. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing what? The Word of God. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I've had many a revival in my car listening to good preaching. Amen. Hey, I was listening to a black preacher the other day. He says, man, when you is standing on the rock, you ain't got no mud to sling. I thought that was pretty profound. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. And some of y'all don't get it because you're throwing too much mud around. Right. need to get on that rock. Yeah. Amen. Y'all with me? Yeah. 
Yeah, the enemy, they want to ruin us, ruin our families, separate us, mess us up. You know what Samson got? There's six verses, and they came after him. He got weary in well-doing. He went up to that rock of Edom. What did he go up to that rock of Edom for? He wanted a rest. He wanted a refuge. He wanted away from the trouble of the battle. He wanted some relief. Hey, could, could, could I just be honest? I mean, I'm not a psychologist, and I don't go into all that psycho babble, but there's a lot of stress in the world today. I mean, the devil used that stress to try to destroy you, tear you up, mess you up. And so, uh, but he went up to the rock of Edom. You know what he did? He went to the wrong rock. You know, guys, you need to be careful where you seek your rest and relief and refuge. If you're not careful, uh, you'll find more comfort with the worldly crowd than God's people. You'll find more comfort in golf than the gospel. You'll find more comfort in sports than in searching the scriptures. You'll find more rest in the movies than in meeting at the church. Yeah. You'll find more comfort in the pleasures of the world than preaching the word of God. True. You'll find more comfort in television than telling the old, old story. Right. Better right. watch where you go for that rest and comfort. Yeah. Right. You know what, some of, some of y'all now, I'm not trying to be unkind, but some of y'all have seared your conscience. I was in a crowd of saved people the other day, and uh, they're saved, and whatever else they were, they were saved. And uh, I said, uh, they were talking about somebody, and I said, that, that guy is a retard. And uh, 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 they're gasping, and they're gone, and they're gone. You can't use that word. I said, why not? That's not politically correct. Well, listen, I was raised up in a different America, and when I was a Cub Scout, every year we went to the retard place, and we did crafts with the retards, and we ate with the... Are y'all with me? Uh, see, some of y'all... See, you are brainwashed by that television and the world. And so you know what I said? I said, when's the last time you acted like that when somebody took the Lord's name in vain? See, some of y'all sit in front of that boob tube. They cuss and damn. They hell this and GD this and everything. That doesn't bother you. Your conscience has been seared. You look at, you look at nakedness. You look at adultery. You look at fornication. You look at the sodomites. And you're entertained by it. That's not a good place to be. We need to grab a new jawbone. Go to work. Y'all with me? Yeah. I tell you, when we as the children of God give our desires to these comforts, God's going to start messing with your comforts. You know what? We, we, I'm 66, been saved 42 years. You know what I have figured out? As a saved man trying to live for God, I am never going to be very comfortable in this world. Everybody is shooting for comfort. Can I illustrate real quick? This isn't in the message. How old was Abraham when he had that child? What's his name? Help me here. I'm getting old. Isaac. How old was he when Isaac came? He's 100 years old. And I don't know how old Isaac was, 13, 16, 17, when God said what? Kill him. Kill him. Here's this old man. He's walked by faith. He left mom and dad. He left the hometown. He followed the Lord. He did it. And then what God, God gives him the biggest test of his life when he's an old man. Did he do it to hurt him? No. Did God know what he was going to do? Did Abraham know what he was going to do? No. Not until he. Don't tell me what you're going to do. Let me know what you're doing. That's good, preacher. What did the Philistines do? Verse 13, they bound them. They show up, the enemy shows up, they bind them. There's no liberty, no liberty to preach. Listen to me, church. It's as much your responsibility that there's liberty here for the man of God to preach as it is for the man of God to study and pray and have liberty in preaching. 
Now, I'm old enough and I'm cantankerous enough that you don't give me liberty, I'm just going to go ahead and take it. You okay with that? But there ought to be liberty to preach. He got bound up. He didn't have no liberty to fight. There was no freedom. There was no life in the service. We shouldn't come in like dead people. We shouldn't come in. We ought to have some life about us. Not all bound up. Nothing's going to come easy. There's no fellowship because he's all bound up. There's no enjoying the presence of God. No enjoying the Bible. I've been looking forward to coming down here for weeks and months. My folks have been praying. I said, why do they pray? They know how sorry their preacher is and they're praying for you. I oh, shut up. So what do you do when you're bound up? You do like, like Samson did. Grab a new jawbone and go to battle against the enemy. Amen. Hip and thigh. Slaughter him hip and thigh. Go to work on the enemy. Anything that looked like an enemy, Samson went after him. Amen. And he wasn't, he wasn't real concerned about, uh, what do they call that? Residual. Huh? Collateral, he wasn't worried about collateral damage. That's why we won World War II. And that's why we ain't won another war since. Stupid. Never mind. If you are bound up, that means the enemy is already in your camp. So bound up, you can't enjoy the Lord. Hard to enjoy the Lord when there's sin in the camp. When there's unconfessed and unrepented of sin, things you know shouldn't be in there. Bitterness, holding a grudge, some habit, something. That enemy, he wants to come in. He wants to tear up your house. I tell you what, you better get in that Bible and get a new jawbone. Samson saw that jawbone laying there. It was just laying there. I don't imagine it looked like very much. Jawbone of an ass, what's, I mean... But the Holy Ghost empowered Samson to use it. And he went to killing Philistines with it. And when he was done, a thousand. That's one guy. One jawbone. Can you see him when he's done? I like it. Verse number 17. The Bible says, and it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand. It wasn't the jawbone. It was God Amen. who empowered him yep. and used him. And I thank God for Samson. I thank God for the great victory that we read about. Right. But you know what? That's not going to help me today. You know what we need? We need some folks. We need some preachers who will grab a new jawbone and go to work on the enemies of God, the enemies of Christians, the enemies of Christian families, the enemies of the church in our generation. Man, I, I love to read about the great preachers of the past. I love to read their messages. I, I love to read about uh, who was that guy up in the... Uh, the, the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards. Yeah. I mean, you know, you hear about that, that message, that sinners in the hands of an angry God. I've read that message. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Edwards was nearsighted. He had to hold the paper up like this, and he read his message, right. and he read it in a monotone. Right. It's not the shouting and the screaming and the up and the, right. it's a power of the Holy Ghost. Right. Yeah. Now listen to me. Every preacher's different. You don't copy somebody, you just be who you're supposed to be. But what we must have is that anointing of the Holy Ghost. Got to have it. I'm telling you. I've read a lot after uh, Salvation Army guy. Help me, Booth, William Booth. Golly. I like old Uncle Bud Robinson. Now, some of y'all wouldn't even eat with him because he wasn't an independent Baptist. 
but he had more God than most independent Baptists have today. Right. Are you all with me? But those old times, that's not going to help me now. And I remember I was pastoring. I, I got saved at a Roman Catholic background, got into a Bible, uh, Bible school. It's just a Bible church and, and, and got uh, some education. And I was pastoring. And, and, uh, and I'm going to be honest with you. I did not know about the filling and the power of the Holy Ghost. I just, I fell in love with the Lord. The Lord called me to preach and I started preaching. And God in His grace and His mercy crossed my paths with Brother Jack Wood. And that old man of God, uh, he, he took a liking to me. He knew I needed a whole lot of help. And he put his arm around me and he introduced me to Brother Homer Smith and Dr. Don Green and Brother Lanny Hasbrook and, and uh, uh, who's that crazy North Mountain Georgia preacher? Uh, up in heaven, Earl Hughes. Earl Hughes, that guy scared me to death, he's spooky, <laughs> but you hang around those people, you, you realize you need a touch of God, and you realize God died to save the world, and you get involved in missions, are y'all with me? Yes. Right, amen. Yep. And since then, I, I, that's all I am concerned about, having the power of God, but I have seen the enemies in the camp, I'm talking about our camp. The enemy's in the camp, and he's bound up the people of God. We're losing our children. We're losing them to lust. Well, you raise them up in a, in a house with a bunch of television and movies and worldly stuff. What in the world do you think is going to happen for crying out loud? Laziness? Have you ever seen such a lazy generation? Amen. Golly. My son, my son, he stopped in a fast food place, and he made an order. And uh, this guy is on the phone, a worker on the phone, and there's the, there's the uh, order in, on the shelf. All he's got to do is pick it up and turn it over here. My son's waiting on it, and he's on his phone. And my son takes after his mother. He's sort of short-tempered. <laughs> and he goes, hey, how about handing me that bag? He said, hey, give me a minute here, will you? Well, then it was on. That's the generation we're raising. Lazy. Oh, our kids aren't scared of hard work. They'll lay right down next to it and go to sleep. Lying. Materialism. Hey, your kids need God. They don't need materialism. Worldliness. Worldliness. They got to have so-and-so sneakers and so-and-so's jeans and so-and-so's this. Worldly. Why don't they want to dress like the man of God? Right. Wrong heroes. Boy, that went over good, didn't it? We're losing our families to divorce, drinking, drugs, the deception of sin. We're losing our church members to sin and what I like to call sensitivity. Well, you hurt my feelings, and I'm going to go down the street, and I'm going to go there and bounce all around. Well, if your feelings can be hurt, I'm going to work at trying to hurt them tonight. I can't sing, I can't play an instrument, I'm not very bright. These guys, they alliterate their outlines. I have three thesauruses at the house and I still can't alliterate outlines. But I can get in people's kitchen and get them angry. And all I have to do is preach the Bible. That's all I gotta do, just preach the Bible. Amen? Hey, y'all are not a dumb, bunch. I know you know your Bible. Go with me to Revelation 2 and 3. The book of the Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. Okay, we are not the church of Ephesus. They labored and they fainted not. We are not the church of Smyrna. They were faithful unto death. We are not the church of Pergamos. They held his name fast and denied not the faith. We are not the church of Thyatira. The Lord saw their works, their charity, their service, their faith, and their patience. We are not the church of Sardis. They defiled not their garments. We're not the church of Philadelphia that kept his word. Do you know what we are? We're the church of Laodicea. Look there in ch chapter 3, verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm 
and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That does not sound very good to me. And I want to tell you something. I don't want to be lukewarm. I mean, when I got saved, the Holy Ghost moved into my heart. He changed my way of thinking. He changed my one-twos. And I got under the preaching of the Word of God. And I mean to tell you, the old men of God said, you are not to go to the movies. And I didn't go to the movies. The old men of God said, a man shouldn't dress like a woman, and a woman shouldn't dress like a man. Say amen right there. Amen. And they started preaching about, get rid of your cigarettes, and get rid of your beer, and get rid of your dope. Hey, amen, that's good preaching. To get that cussing out of your mouth. God got me under those great men of God preaching. But he had good, strong, hard preaching. Did nothing but help me. Did nothing but help my family. But you ought not to just preach it. You ought to live it. Not just at the church house. All the time. We okay? Lukewarm. I don't want to be lukewarm. It's hard to find... Hey, Gary and I, we got saved in the same generation. We got saved back in the 60s and the 70s. And I'm telling you, when we got saved, we got, saved, we got something different than this new generation's right. getting. Amen. Buddy, we'd jump in a car. We would travel six hours to go here preaching. Yeah. We didn't have no money. We had enough gas money. We slept in the cars. We slept on the church pews. But we wanted to get where God was at. And we'd get fired up, and we'd go back home, and we'd knock on doors, and we'd bring people out to church, and we'd want to do something for God. We wanted to train our children up for the Lord. We didn't want one foot in the world and one foot in the church. We came out of the world and we got in all the way. Amen. I don't want to go back. No. I don't want to be lukewarm. I don't want to be part, part of this compromising, apostate, worldly church. No. I want to be boiling. I want to be on hot. About my praying. About my preaching. About my witnessing. About my Bible reading. About my worship. Hard to worship when that heart's all worked up with sin. We're living in the time of luxurious living. You know, there's no stir. You know, <clears throat> boiling. Talk about fervent. Talk about boiling. What's boiling water do? Put instruments in. It sterilizes it. There's not much sterilizing going on nowadays. They're all afraid of hurting people's feelings. Look at me. I did not travel all this way to hurt anybody's feelings for God's sake, but I did come to try to help you. And the only help I have for you is that precious book right there. And the message, I have been praying for months that God would give me the message that he wants me to preach to y'all. And I mean to preach it that the Holy Ghost, but your heart is the ground. I know I'm preaching the incorruptible seed of the word of God. If that seed falls in good ground, it'll bring forth fruit. So when it brings no fruit in my life, that's because your heart is hard and stony. And you don't believe it. You believe that book, it'll work effectually in your life. That's what it says. Is that what it says? Does that Bible say, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord? If you believe that, it'll work in your life. Does that Bible say, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind? You say, well, I don't think, I don't think that way. That's because you don't read that book. That's because you're not in that book. I tell my folks at church, I said, you need to read your Bible. You need to read it every day. You need to study your Bible. I said, if you people would read your Bible and study your Bible, you'd agree with my preaching. Because I'm preaching the Bible. You love Jesus? Amen. Amen. Luxurious living. They were rich and increased with goods. Are we not rich and increased with goods? Now, now look at me. God has blessed us. Don't misunderstand me. But when you put that luxurious living ahead of God, it has become a false God. It has become an idol in your life. And your priorities are whacked out. Show me your checkbook. I'll show you where your heart is. Where your treasure is there, where your heart. You ever hear of a preacher by the name of Billy Allen? 
Billy Allen started about 40 some churches. Between 40 and 50 churches, he started down in Louisiana. He was a uh, Cajun. And uh, he's just a short man. And uh, boy, he's a great preacher. He preached a uh, missions conference at my church. And he said, you know, if you all were right with God, he said, your missions giving would be your largest payment each month. Well, y'all got quiet on that, didn't you? <laughs> so you ain't got no problem with a $2,000 house payment, you know, and an $800 car payment. But God forbid that you give some money to missions. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I've done fetch the coldness on the service now. Oh, yeah. I'm not even preaching on missions now. Yeah. But see, where your ha- treasure is, there will your heart be off also. No, not. It says, it, it says there in, in Revelation, they know not. Well, this generation, they know everything. The Lord's on the outside knocking, trying to get in. He's not in the church. He's not welcomed in the church. He dwells in holiness. They're lewd. L-E-W-D. Look it up. Lewd. Nakedness is mentioned two times, 17 and 18. We are living in the most immodest generation in America, and that immodesty has come into the church. Are y'all, hey, how we doing? Okay, okay, I need some help. You, you, will you come here and help me? You, you, come, come, come. I need some more help. Do you mind helping me? You don't want to help me? You will, come here. You coward. Yeah. Yeah. Buddy, come help me. Yes, sir. Doctor... Do you all know who Dr. Ruckman is? Okay, Dr. Ruckman taught me this many years ago, okay? This this young man right here, he is going to represent the world in 1900. Okay, the world in 1900. How were the women dressed? All women, not Christian women, all women. They were dressed modestly, which meant they were covered from their necks to their ankles. In a dress. The world in 1900. Where was the church in 1900? They were separated from the world. Is that right? Right. Are you all with me? Okay. Then the world went from 1900 to 1920. Remember the roaring 20s? You remember the roaring 20s, don't you, preacher? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. And so they have done what? They've gotten more liberal. Are y'all with me? And what happened to the skirts in 1920s? They started coming up. Okay, how how many of you have ever heard of the New York Times? Okay, conservative? Christian? Do you know what the New York Times wrote in 1920? The New York Times in 1920 said, women's hemlines that are more than nine inches off the floor are nowhere near modest. That's the world. Now, the church in 1920, is she still right where she was in 1900? Nope. She's drifted a little bit. Now we're not in 1920. Now we're in 2019. How's the world doing? Y'all know. Are y'all with me? Where's the church? Is the church back there? So, barely. Barely. No. Now the church is not very far. And the church is where the world was. Ask ye for the old path and walk therein. But they said, we will not. Thanks, guys. Y'all with me? Grab a jawbone and go to work on the enemy. The world is not your friend. The world is not for your children. The world is not for this church. I'm against the devil. I am against the world. 
And if you're against the church, then I'm against you. Every good thing in my life has happened through the church of the living God. And it's not a building. It's that man that God puts in that assembly to shepherd that flock. Say amen right there. I'll tell you what. You need the church a whole lot more than the church needs you. If you think if you think the church would fall apart because you walk out, you're just a proud poppycock. You need the church. Thank God for the church. But we're lewd. We're immodest. And all you got to, hey, listen, just go to the Bible for a definition of modesty. Would you do that? Would you let the Bible be your final authority in faith and practice? Amen. Amen. Uh, I'm losing you, aren't I? Your favorite TV show. It was a blind te- generation. He said, anoint your eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. People can't see. We're living in perilous times. Why would you let your children have internet access with, 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 uh, with all the foolishness and all the sin and all the degradation going on? No. Oh, it's a blind generation. I want to just show you, that was my introduction. I want to show you three things that, ja- that jawbone in Samson's life, Samson's hand did. Number one, it slew the enemy. It slew the enemy. I still believe that book will slay the enemy. I believe that. Isaiah 58 and verse 1, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their, tra- show who their transgressions? My people. The church, the children of God, and the house of Jacob, their sins. Somebody says, oh, there's no need for all that, preacher. I believe there is. I believe there is. Absolutely. I, want my, I wanted my children to be brought up on that kind of preaching, and I want my grandchildren to be brought up on that gra- kind of preaching. Amen, absolutely. It slew the enemy. What are the sins of this? See, I think it's the responsibility of every preacher to figure out what the sins of this generation are and preach against them. Every generation is different. You find out the course of the world for your generation and go against it. I mean, the world's just going to lead you into degradation and sin and deny God? No, I'm not for that. We're living in an adulterous generation. We're living in a, in, in a, in a, in, in a uh, generation that fornication is just running rampant. We're, run, we're living in a generation that music... You all know the devil is the original music man. The devil knows the power and the influence of music. And I don't care what the lyrics say. When I'm listening to something and it reminds me of stuff that I was listening to in the dope dens and the barn and the bars, that is not of God. God is not doing the hokey pokey in heaven. The Bible says, as obedient children in 1 Peter, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. He didn't say be worldly. He didn't say be carnal. He said be holy, like the Lord. TV, movies. Yeah, you know, you know, all that is is making provision for your flesh. Right. You know, you want to be entertained. You want to find rest. And there is absolutely no spiritual value in what you're doing. And you'll gripe about reading a chapter of the Bible a day and sit in front of that stuff from Hollywood for hours. And then when you talk, you can't talk about the Bible. You just talk about all the worldly stuff. Movies, pleasure, entertainment. Over there in Romans, I don't know, I don't, I don't understand God's people. Uh, it says in, this is Romans, you don't have to turn there. The Bible says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, Inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only of the same, 
but have pleasure in them that do them. When you sit there and laugh at them and are entertained by them, that's what that is talking about. It's crazy. That, that great preacher over in England, Latimer, he sent Henry VIII. You all remember Henry VIII went through about 14, 15 wives. Remember that? He wrapped up a Bible and he sent it to Henry VIII. Latimer did. And in that Bible, he wrote him a letter. And he put in that letter, he said, King uh, Henry... He said, the Bible says, adulterers and whoremongers, God will judge. We can't hold back the message. We need to anoint our eyes so we can see. We need to put some restraints on this flesh. You don't overcome your flesh. You're not going to live a victorious life. Got to do that. You know, you talk about the, the dress... It, it, Okay, I was raised in a private Roman Catholic school. So we had uniforms that we wore. My mom and dad, uh, they were Roman Catholics. They were just middle class people. But we had play clothes, we had school clothes, and we had church clothes. Are you all with me? Yeah. And, uh, and uh, uh, the thought of going to church in our play clothes never came into our minds. That was the house of God. That was the church. Are we okay here? Okay, did you know that the Vatican, Roman Catholic, they have the Vatican police, dress police. You are not walking into the Vatican on a tour in shorts, tank tops, or bare shoulders on a woman. They have a stand outside the Vatican that will sell you paper uh, skirts and paper uh, blouses and stuff to cover up. Isn't it sad that Roman Catholics have higher standards than independent Baptists? I think it is. I mean, is Deuteronomy 22 still in the Bible? Is it an abomination for a man to wear women's clothing? And is it abomination for a woman to wear man's? Hey, look, look at me. Look at this monkey suit I got on tonight. I am covered up. You ain't seeing no parts of my body. And you ought to be glad about that. <laughs> well, hey, listen to me. In Genesis 3, when God clothed Adam and Eve in coats of skins, dress became a spiritual matter in the eyes of God. You say, I can dress any way I want to dress. You're right, you can. But that doesn't mean it pleases the Lord. You can do, and you know what you're going to do? You're going to do just what you want to do. But see, you're supposed to be a Christian. You're supposed to be bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body, in your soul, and in your spirit. So it's not supposed to be what you want. It's supposed to be what God wants. But we're missing the boat on that one, aren't we? Amen. Lay out of sight, see, tattoos. Oh, I've had saved people. Hey, look, I got a scripture verse tattooed. You read your Bible? Oh, what, I hit a bump there too? Y'all getting tattoos? Christians should, hey, now listen to me. If you got them before you got saved, well, we're not, just cover them up for God's sake. We don't want to lead, give a bad example to the younger generation. But you're telling me you're saved and you're going to mark up your body in violation of what the Bible says? Piercings and all that kind of business? Oh, my. So, yeah, you preach all that stuff, you're going to run people off. I've been, reading, I've been reading books on the seals. You ever read anything on the seals? Uh, I just finished a book on Lone Survivor. I, you, many of you all uh, probably heard that story. Those four, those four seals went into enemy territory because they were looking for that, that guy, that, that uh, whoever, Okay. And, and what happened, what happened is a goat, some goat herders, I think it was three or four goat herders, and their goats fa- came upon them suddenly because it was in the mountains and everything. And those guys knew that those goat, goat herders were going to leave there and tell the Taliban right away. You know what those seals should have done to those goat herders? Shot them. Shot them dead. It's war. But they didn't. You know why they didn't? Because of the stupid press in America. And because of the fear of being charged with murder. 
And so you know what they did? They let him go. And next thing you know, what do you got? 200 Taliban come after those seals. Hey, you know what those four, you know what those four seals did? They annihilated over 200 of those ragheads. And you, know, and you know what they thought? They thought, if we just had our normal complement of guys, we'd whoop this crowd. I like that. You see, it's not the quantity. It's the quality. Buddy, you give me a handful of men that are sold out for God. Buddy, we'll storm the bastions of hell. We'll do something for, for God this side of heaven by the grace of God. It's not the numbers, huh? It's the quality of the men. Man, we're living in such a crazy thing. Some of you ladies, a man gets to preaching about a woman being submitted to her husband, and buddy, you just about have a conniption fit. <laughs> Me? Obey him? Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Submission. I didn't say surrender. I understand the difference between submission and surrender. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was running a certain situation. And he said, stop or shoot us and I surrender. That was not submission, buddy. Submission was that day I got down on my face. I told God, you saved me. I've made a mess of my life. And if you want to do something with my life, I'm giving it to you. That was the second smartest thing I ever did in my life. I, you, you're looking at somebody that's been blessed. I have, God, God gave me a, a real blessing about a year ago. He brought a Down syndrome child to my church. That Down syndrome child is 48 years old. His name is Earl. Man. You know why I identify so much with Earl? Because I'm a retard. When God looks over the banisters of heaven, he looks down and sees that retard, Mike Keenan. He ain't got no talent can't play nothing, can't sing, not very smart. He's losing a little bit of brain that he has. But boy, look at him down there. He just loves me. He just loves my people. He's just trying to do the best that he can do. Amen. Brother Earl loves to get a microphone in his hand. So Christmas time, we sang a Christmas carol together, him and me, two retards. <laughs> Had the time of our life. See, some of y'all, you have way too high an opinion of yourself. Right. See, I know I'm not worthy. I know I don't deserve to preach the unsearchable riches. But by his gracious choice, and I want to honor him. <sighs> Quick story. Are you all done? Good friend, good friend of mine went to went to uh, visit an old lady. Some people in his church asked him. This was back in the 50s. Went up to a second floor apartment. Here's this old lady laying on the floor, blood all over the place. Here's this man over against the wall. His head's chopped open, blood's blowing out. And he came in to witness to him. And uh, what the people didn't tell him is that was the meanest woman that lived in that town. And so long story short, the ambulance came, took the man away. They wanted to take the woman away, but she wouldn't go. And so the preacher called his wife and a lady from the church, and they cleaned her up and dressed her and, 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 and got her. And so he said to her, he said, Miss Ollie, the reason I came was I was, wanted to talk to you about the Lord and how to be saved. And she just had her head down, and she didn't say anything for about a minute. And she said, I can't get saved. And he says, oh, no, Miss Ollie, you can get saved. And she said, oh, no. And she went on a litany. And this, this preacher, at the time, he was 36 years old, and he'd been a Navy man for 27, so for, up until he was 27 years old. And so he'd seen some darker sides of life. But he said this woman told him by the time she was 19, she'd killed two men. She'd been a prostitute. She'd been a drug dealer. She'd been a thief. She'd done time in jail. She had a litany of things that would curl your hair. And when she was all done, the preacher opened up that book, and he told her about the Lord's love. He told her about the Lord's Amen. grace. And he said, no matter what you've done, the blood of Jesus can cleanse you from all that. And he just read that Bible to her for about 15, 20 minutes. And tears started coming down her cheek. 
Next thing you knew, she slid out of her chair and knelt down. And she prayed and asked God to save her. Oh, yeah. I think she was 78 years old when she got saved. She's meaner than a junkyard dog. She, hey, if that was the end of the story, that'd be good. She started coming to church. This preacher is Brother Homer Smith. This preacher's church was in Bristol, Tennessee. And he had, he had uh, what he called the Texas Quartet. He said, the reason we called it the Texas Quartet is because everybody from Texas always brags about things and says things are bigger than what they really are. He said, and they called it the Texas Quartet because some days there'd be four people singing and some days there'd be six people singing and some days there'd be ten people singing, so they called it the Texas Quartet. <laughs> Miss Ollie started talking, singing in the quartet and coming to church and bringing visitors to the church. One day, the preacher gets a phone call. Preacher, preacher, you got to get down to Miss Ollie's. The police are down there. He goes, what in the world? He gets down to Miss Ollie's. She's on the second floor. And there's the chief of police in his squad car with the doors locked. And the preacher comes up, and Miss Ollie's there. And the and preacher knocks, and he goes, get that woman away from me. He says, she's trying to hug me and tell me that Jesus loves me, and Jesus wants to save me, and she's thanking me for this and thanking me for that. But he, she, she just fell in love with the Lord. Amen. All that cussing went, all that drinking went, all that dirty living went. But after a few years, she went up to the preacher one Wednesday night. And she said, preacher, I'm just, I'm going to commit suicide. I said, Miss Ollie, she had relatives that were trying to get her to cuss and relatives that would try to get her to drink and old folks would come around try to get her into the old life. And you know what she said? She said, Preacher, I'd rather die than bring shame on my precious Lord. Amen. Oh, for all of us to have that thought in our hearts and mind that we'd rather die than bring shame on the Lord Jesus Christ. One of the most precious things you have is your testimony. It's taken me 43 plus years to get the testimony that I have. You know how fast I can lose that testimony? Five minutes. Less than five minutes. I thank God for Dr. Don Green. All he did is preached about your testimony. Living a holy and a godly and a sanctified and a separated life. I appreciate that good preacher. I want my testimony right. I'll tell you what that jawbone did in Samson's hand with the anointing of the Holy Ghost. It slewed the enemy. Huh? Number two, it satisfied his thirst. Hmm. That weapon that Samson used fighting was the same thing God used to revive his soul. We preach the word. Is that not what we told? Preach the word. Reprove. Rebuke, exhort, in season, out of season, the whole counsel of God. The Bible says in Jeremiah that you bring your sword back and don't, don't, let, don't, don't let that blood out. You ain't doing a good job. And then that's that book that we get into. And it sings to our soul. Gives us that fresh drink. Encourages us blesses us. We shouldn't need anybody's approval but God's approval. The jawbone, it slew the enemy, it satisfied his thirst. And you know what else it did? It saved the Jewish people. You all with me? How do you save a nation? You kill the enemy. Is that right? How do we keep the terrorists from tearing up America? You kill the terrorist. How do you save a church from sin and the world? You kill sin and the world. You preach against it. Hey, in every war, people get hurt in order that other people are saved. How many men gave their lives? How many women have given their lives that we can enjoy the liberty today? Well, you know what we need to do? We need to get a new jawbone. 
And we need to get back to that hip and thigh preaching. We need some hip and thigh. Could I say this? We need some hip and thigh living. Some holy, godly living by the grace of God. So that jawbone that slew the enemy, it satisfied his thirst, and it saved the people of Israel. You know what I'm trying to do at Old Paz Baptist Church? I'm trying to save my people. I'm not talking about saving them from hell. I'm talking about saving them from a worthless life. Amen. Saving them from the world, tearing them apart, the adversary ruining their families. And I preach that hip and thigh preaching all the time. Amen. You get that anointing of God. Dr. Green taught us as young preachers, he said, hard preaching without prayer is like glass and it cuts. He said, but hard preaching with prayer is like grace and it does nothing but help by the grace of God. Let's pray. What you ought to do is you ought to mind the Lord. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. The only invitation